So for today, let us talk about another fundamental concept in learning, the power of feedback. You will learn today how this concept is cutting across the human body, across human learning and across artificial intelligence. And just that makes it so fundamental. The human brain is made out of about 10 to the power of 11, so of about 100 billion nervous cells. They have a trillion, this is 10 to the power of 14 connections. And that makes the human brain to the most complex system in the known universe. And there's a rule behind that that is called the HEPS rule of learning. Neurons that fire together, wire together. What does that mean? It means they increase their connection. If they are firing coincidentally, if they release their electronic charge at the same moment and that they are connected to each other, they increase their connectivity. They react more willingly to each other. Just imagine you are uh, uh, meeting some other person regularly, you work with them on a daily basis, or the place you go to party, he or she is always there. That gives you a picture how this works. You would be react more willingly on somebody you are working, acting together on a daily basis uh, than some stranger you've never met. And that is um, how HEPS rule of learning works. And HEPS rule of learning is in, um, in fact fundamental. That is the basic structure. So if you have two different impacts, uh, inputs to consider, say um, the olfactory input through your, through your nose, you're smelling something and it smells fine. So that stimulates some neurons. And then you have a visual input. You see a flower, a red flower. And if that happens together on a regular basis, these connections in your brain fire together and wire together. And you would instantly recognize the rose whenever you either see or smell a rose. But there comes the feedback. That's how children learn. They are smelling and looking and tasting things. And um, after a while, they see, okay, there is this red flower again. And um, if you were a parent, you know that your um, kids would misplace things once in a while. They would see a tulip and say, oh, that's a rose. Instinctively, as a parent, you know you have to react here you say, no, that's not a rose, that's a tulip. And you would show it the differences. So the kid makes a prediction and you do a correction. And that increases uh, the probability that your kid would identify a rose correctly next time. It reduces error. And this is a very fundamental process of learning. We see Another thing in artificial intelligence, and that's called the back propagation. How do they do this in machine learning? Now they are presenting a couple of information to the so-called input layer. That could be the chip of a camera, very much like the retina in your eye who collects information. And in a machine learning network, the information, there is something, there is light, I see a thing, would propagate to the ne network. At the very end, um, at the um, deepest layer, um, there would be a pattern recognition taking place. But you have to train such a network. The network would be able to identify a peach and a banana and a pie correctly if you provide feedback and I would suggest we try out how this works right now. In MWork 5 you may simply train a machine learning model to solve your engineering problem. Choose the sprites card and add an extension here. Choose the teachable machine extension. First, 
I want to train the model to recognize a peer. Type peer into the label box and hold a peer in front of your camera. Note that the model does not know what a peer is, like a little child, but you show him. Next, you show him examples of peaches, small and large peaches. At first, the neural net predicts this to be another peer, because that is what it knows. But this is a prediction error. With more examples, the prediction gets better. Last, show him your empty hand. You know, this hand was always in the picture. The network needs to distinct the empty hand from the fruit that it carries. At the very end, you've got a model that's trained to differentiate a peer from a peach with reasonable precision. See the green bars moving. Try around with this. Get in touch how it feels to teach a neural network. This is much more ethically sound than trying it with a human being. For decades, researchers were sure that backpropagation of feedback only works in a computational neural network, because computational designers have designed it into the neural network. But in 1999, Rao and Ballard demonstrated that their computer simulation actually explained a lot of the neuronal activity that was seen in the visual cortex of a human brain. Carl Friston was cited with the exclamation, well, that's quite remarkable. And given the fact what a truly British gentleman Carl Friston is, this must have been quite a shock. From this moment onwards, Carl Friston propagated the model of predictive coding in the human brain. The higher order functions work tirelessly to develop expectations about what can be seen. If the lower level neurons detect something which they had no prediction for, like this rat that got stuck in a gully, in a sewer, this travels upwards to drive the development of new categories. The overall goal of the brain is to minimize uncertainty by minimizing the prediction errors. And this is a very active process. It is called the active inference by neuroscientists. We could also call it exploring the world, explaining the world, forming actively new categories to explain what can be seen. The great motivation psychologists Heinz and Jutta Heckhausen, they made it clear that exploration is a universal motivational system in mammals. It, quote, engages the organism with the goal of extending its range of control over the external environment. Because having control reduces uncertainty. In most mammals, including apes, including ourselves, there is, quote, a preference for behavior event contingencies. When we act upon an object, we want to predict how it behaves. That brings us back to Piaget, Ebley and Wittmann's object operation impact cycle. We learn that this cycle is rooted deep down to the neuronal level into the brain structure of us mammals. There is no such thing as an active inference center in our brain. It is the way the neurons work. They are connected with each other on several levels from vision perception to active learning and googling for news. A rat, for example, should run away when we see it. This one was too fat and gets struck. That was not to be expected. To end with the story, luckily for the rat, seven ferrymen of Bernsheim Auersbach were alarmed and screwed the rat out of the pothole. The fat rat of Germany went viral. It was awarded as the animal rescue of the year 2019 by the British BBC and the fire team gained 570 euro just by selling t-shirts with pictures of the rescue. How can we test 
if this works. Brains want to reduce their prediction error and they need feedback for this. You do not want to do all of the feedback yourself. Try the POE method with your students. The POE method was described by Champagne, Gunston and Klopfer in 1985. It was tested on a large scale from primary schools by Palmer to 11th grade physics students by David Tregus from Curtin University in Australia, both in 1995. First, you show your students an object and let them predict how this object will behave. If Elisa drops the upper part of this coil, how will the lower part behave? Will the lower end A fall down to the ground or B go up in the sky or C will just remain there? as if there was no gravity. If you have more students in your class, and I assume you have, then you might want to make a poll question, a quiz or a clicker question out of these questions. Now, after you have gathered the results, observe what actually happens. You did not expect this, right? The lower end just sits there until it gets caught by the upper end. Well, nobody expects this to happen. If you have made a poll question in your class, it is good to assure everybody now that they were not alone with their prediction, may it be right or false. We have a prediction error here that should make us curious as a learning group and that should lead to co-creation of explanations now. If you do it right, the predict, observe, explain method encourages creativity, communication, collaboration and critical thinking, which are considered the top skills for the 21st century. The learning outcome will prove if your strategy works. With an effect size of 0.7, giving feedback is one of the most effective teaching strategies ranked by the famous study of John Hattie from Australia. He coins his strategy as visible learning. The students should see their prediction and prediction errors, as should the teachers, too. The reformed teaching protocol ATOP scores when students make predictions, estimations and or hypothesizes and devised means for testing their predictions. It also scores well when students are reflective about their learning as John Hattie recommends too. In the EdTPA Rubik 2, you should plan to support varied student learning needs. To reach level 5, you should include specific tragedies to identify and respond to preconceptions and common errors, like applying the POE approach. Good STEM tools make it easy to apply the predict, observe, explain method. Give a drone or a robot to your students. Let them evaluate the program code. Use Scratch preferably for the visual thinking. And then let the students predict how the hardware will behave. How far will the robot travel? Where will the drone land? Observe the behavior. Let the students explain the prediction error and correct the program code for better prediction or for a behavior event contingency in the terms of Heckhausen. This makes your students feel to be in control, makes them feel confident. And that is, according to Heckhausen, a primary source of motiv motivation in mammals. This is how the human brain works. You, as a teacher, made several human brains work as an unity.